today we're going to talk about um, modeling API resources to suit the needs of the application, what HADIOS is, that acronym, what it means, and some of the trade-offs we make um, when identifying and exposing resources through an HTTP API. <coughs> All right, um, here we go. So we're going to assume in many of the examples that we covered today that our web application has, has been mostly designed. Um, that is, the UX components of that have, have been have been designed and thought through. And all we have to do is write this um, middle yellow layer here, the HTTP API, that will support the design goals of the application. So uh, to get started, Roy Fielding wrote his doctoral dissertation on an architectural style he called REST. Uh, it describes some of the patterns of distributed applications that he observed in the early web, and then formalizes some of those patterns and describes why they work better than others uh, for distributed software systems. So REST is more than just nice URLs and HTTP verbs. Fielding's dissertation is about the search for and design of a distributed client-server architectural style um, based on hypermedia accessible resources. So if your API doesn't include hypermedia in its responses, it's not a RESTful API. Um, if the client is not leveraging hypermedia responses, you do not have a RESTful architecture. It requires both client and server interacting in that way. Now, it may still work, and, that's, uh, and it may work great, and that's fine. It's just not REST. Um, we're going to talk about you know, kind of the, the pure REST and, and some of the trade-offs you need to make to get there. Um, um, for, uh, imagine you went to Amazon's website to buy something, right? But instead of search boxes and links, you had to read a printed manual that guides you through the website. Um, there's no links. If you want to look at a product, you have to type that into the location bar. Um, if you wanted to um, make a purchase, you'd have to type that into the location bar and code it. And that would be really annoying on the web. But we do this all the time with our APIs. Um, we give developers some documentation and, and then tell them the set of things they can do and say, you know, good luck. So um, REST is a distributed, resource-based, hypermedia-driven application that conform to a simple, uniform interface and architectural style in the same way uh, pretty much how web pages have worked almost from the beginning. Um, REST is about applying the same kind of uniform interface to all web client-server interactions, including JavaScript clients and, and APIs. Okay, so let's, let's talk about HTTP for a moment and how this relates to REST. Um, HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Uh, hypertext is a fancy word for links and is arguably the most popular kind of hypermedia. There is a circular dependency between early HTTP implementations Roy Fielding's PhD dissertation and later HTTP specifications. You can think of the latest versions of HTTP as a protocol that enables the tenets of the REST architectural style. Um, HTTP clients, web browsers, make requests. This looks like this. Um, if you were to inspect a web request in your browser, you would see plain text, just like this. This is the protocol that web browsers use to speak to web servers. Um, this is uh, HTTP. Here is a method in dark blue and um, the URI and the HTTP version. Uh, some also optional headers in green and an optional body. Um, servers return responses. And here is the status code in yellow, the corresponding message in orange, and um, some optional headers and body again. And um, we'll be using HTTP examples throughout uh, this presentation, but we'll omit the HTTP headers typically for brevity. Um, and we're going to focus on the URI now, just for a moment, specifically the resource that the URI identifies. So uh, a resource here is defined. This is from the RFC 2616, which is this HTTP specification. A resource is a network data object or service that can be identified by URI. That's, that's pretty much it. Um, that is a, that's a resource. Now, so a resource is really anything in the world that can be represented by information about the resource, including processes or events. So when we ask for a resource, we always get back a representation of the resource, not the resource itself. Um, we can imagine what some representations would include. Um, a mortgage deed resource has a grantor, a legal description of the property, a notary signature, some dates, things like that. A map location resource represented by latitude, longitude, might have the elevation and some place names at that point. Um, a cow resource may have pedigree information, vaccination history, milk yield. Uh, Bitcoin price resource may yield, uh, might return a number or a chart indicating the current price of Bitcoin in US dollars. Um, the Coke Zero resource would tell us the syrup level in the cartridge and when it was last replaced. 
The URI is part of what Fielding calls the uniform interface in his dissertation. Um, the uniform interface is the set of URIs, methods, and headers we use to describe and access resources. So when we use HTTP, the uniform interface is this set of URIs, uh, HTTP verbs, uh, nouns, or uh, methods, however you want to call them, and, and the headers, um, and not nouns, verbs, and, and message bodies. Now, web browsers all work almost the same way and um, on the same kinds of data. And this, is, this uniform interface is what makes the web work as well as it does. It's, it's really remarkable. So a resource state can vary over time. For example, the idea of current weather is the weather right now. It's not what it was yesterday or a month ago. So current always refers to, to the resource as it exists right now. But we might also ask for the weather at a particular point in time. These two resources may refer to the same thing if, if it matches, of course, the time. And this works for any kind of resource that varies over time. Uh, whether versions of a document, um, traffic on a segment of road, uh, blood pressure, a customer account uh, status, anything like that. A resource uh, can have multiple URIs that identify it. But every resource has at least one URI, one unique URI for it. Um, a resource can have many representations. HTTP defines the accept and other headers to tell the server what, the, what representation the client would like. Here we set the accept header to indicate we prefer the JSON representation of the current weather resource. With the accept header, I can ask for a different representation of the same resource. And this is an example of what we call content negotiation. We're asking for the same resource, just a different representation of it. Now, remember when I ask for the weather, I'm not actually getting weather, I'm getting a representation of the weather. This is true of all HTTP resources. Resources are the concepts and models and things that an application is interacting with, uh, some kind of entity or process perhaps. Uh, we interact with these things through sending representations back and forth between the client and the server and back again. Uh, what is the right representation? Uh, the right representation is the one that the application needs to get its work done and also satisfies the business constraints. A good representation is one that allows the client to discover and navigate through the different states of the application without the client also knowing all of the business logic needed to do those things. Which brings us to hypermedia. So hypermedia, um, any client, any web client can parse this string and um, know what to do. You have a form that's asking for a domain name. You could even add some string validation using web components or something like that. The important part is these sections here. Uh, this is hypermedia. It tells the client what it can do and how to do it. It's just forms and links. So we'll look at an example from an application that manages DNS names. Um, once you have a domain name, you can create uh, what are called uh, subdomains. Sometimes they're implemented in DNS as C names or A records, but we'll call them for our purposes subdomains. And these allow you to host, uh, for example, in our example application here, other websites under your main domain. So here we have three subdomains, test one, test two, and test three. Um, this application is capable of adding new subdomains and managing existing subdomains. So how would we model an API to support this application? This is the exercise we're going to do for the next couple of minutes. Um, we're not going to worry about how subdomains are implemented. We're not going to uh, worry about tables and fields and databases and zone files and, and um, method calls and what order that should be. Um, those are important details, but are part of lower level platform concerns. So uh, we're going to focus on the design of the API in relation to the application and see where that takes us. So before we begin, I want to consider the idea that a good REST API um, is not an HTTP pass-through for underlying platform concepts, uh, even if they've been normalized in some way. Um, if we are exposing low-level getters and setters through our high-level HTTP API, we've, we've missed some critical opportunities. So what we want to do, a good REST API presents a, what I call a sympathetic view um, to the application or applications it supports. Um, it models um, resources in ways that are immediately beneficial to the clients rather than ways that are convenient for the platform. Uh, a good REST API makes uh, difficult and thoughtful design trade-offs, uh, not just reflect platform storage objects. Um, REST APIs might interact with multiple platform services in order to compose the right resource and representation for the client. Any questions to this point? Yes. 
So let's look now at the view subdomain request. If we wanted to look at a single subdomain, we might create an endpoint like this. This seems sensible, right? We are asking for the test1.example.com subdomain resource. In the response, we have all of the information we need to build a subdomain, uh, for example, a web component now. Right? This isn't completely true, as we'll discuss later, but we're taking a first swag. Um, here we have the domain, uh, the subdomain part, and um, the directory the content would be served from, and then a, an optional redirection link if, if that applies here. So this is, how to, this is one way of modeling a view a subdomain. What about creating a subdomain resource? This is the form here. This is the application interface that was already designed for us. How would we model this in the API? You can see here that the form expects the subdomain name, uh, domain sec uh, selection, and a file system path. We could create a subdomain using something like this. Here we introduce the concept of a collection. A collection resource is a kind of container for other resources. In REST semantics, you typically post a representation of a resource into the collection in order to create a new resource, as we do here. This is an example of what is called representational state transfer. We, are, we create a representation of a new resource and transfer it, or send it to the server. This causes the server to create or change the state of that resource. And this is part of RESTful design. It, uh, this is different from remote procedure calls. In RPC, we have procedures and arguments. And um, we take certain actions to achieve certain side effects in the system uh, that we, as the client, must know how to do and in what order. Uh, this is also different from object-oriented design, where objects have a clear, limited scope of concerns and cohesive methods that operate on that object. <coughs> Excuse me. In REST, we have representations of resources. So you can think of, as, of them as like uh, documents. Uh, we transfer those documents between the client and the server, and we create a representation of our desired state of a resource, and then give that to the server to process it. In RPC, records have IDs, uh, integers, or something like that, um, that we use as arguments to identify the, the, the component that we're working on in RPC. In REST, the URI uniquely identifies every resource. So w this is how we might create a subdomain. This is the request. The response might look something like this. Um, with the uh, view subdomain response, there are two aspects about this response that make it not quite fully restful um, that we'll talk about later. Uh, but this is a good start. Uh, we see the 201 created status code and a little feedback message. And here is the user interface for updating the redirection URL. Um, so we've, we've done view a single subdomain. We've done uh, create new subdomain. We're now going to update a subdomain. Uh, this is, again, the UI. We don't get to update all of the components. That's part of the design of the application, so that's OK. In this case, patch is probably the best choice. Patch semantics say that we're modifying an aspect of the resource rather than replacing or updating the entire resource. In this case, it's just the, the redirect field of, or, or component of the, of the uh, subdomain. And a response might look like this, 200 OK, and a little message uh, telling them what happened. OK, and then uh, listing subdomains. Uh, what about listing subdomains? So uh, this is the UI for that. There is a, an interface that the customer can see all of their subdomains. That's simple. Uh, remember that a collection is a resource. Um, it's a container for other resources, but it, the collection itself is also a resource, meaning that it gets its own URI. Um, here it's slash subdomains. And we can do things to this resource, such as retrieve it or post to it in order to create a new subordinate resource like we did earlier. And the response might look something like this. Uh, we return a subdomains key uh, whose value is the list of all of the subdomains in the collection. And finally, our last uh, bit of design work for the API is deleting a subdomain. Notice these little trash cans here. Um, so uh, this is also quite easy in REST semantics. We could, be, we could implement it like this. Uh, the HTTP specification defines a delete method uh, for removing a resource. And this would remove the test1 subdomain from the subdomain's collection. And the response might be something like this. So now you can consider for a moment how simple this would be if you're using the curl command line 
uh, web, web uh, user agent, um, how simple that would be to, to accomplish what you wanted to do with these subdomains. It, it's, it's fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, some resources, like subdomains, follow the CRUD patterns pretty well, and the standard HTTP verbs make a lot of sense there. In the context of subdomains, we're going to now jump up a level to the web application to consider how a client would integrate with this API, and we're going to use the API we just designed. I've only got two slides on this because I, I don't want to focus too much on the syntax here. It's, just to give you an idea of, of what this might look like. Uh, this is the component did mount event handler for React. Um, I've completely, uh, this is 100% pseudocode, so you, know, you wouldn't want to copy paste this into anything. But we write a little jQuery client here to fetch the resource uh, subdomains and then integrate it with our React components data model. Um, the render function for an individual subdomain like, might look like this. This is an HTML table row. So, um, but notice this, see these little links here in the middle there? We've hard-coded these URLs, right? How did we know what those are? We have to read the manual, right, and figure out what to put there. What is it about those links that makes them a concern of the user interface? This is a coupling point. We've, created a, uh, we've coupled the UI implementation to the API's implementation. If the API changes, um, we have to make sure all of the clients are updated. Um, if we were to begin to encourage third-party application development, this would be, become really hard to keep track of all those clients. Now, versioning your API is one answer, of course, and there will always be a need for versioning your APIs. Um, but let's consider the moment, uh, for a moment um, the, one of the purposes of a RESTful API. To do that, I'm going to talk about um, Leonard Richardson for a moment. He wrote a few books about REST API design, which I recommend, um, RESTful Web Services and RESTful Web APIs. Uh, Richardson also gave a famous talk in 2008, 2008 about designing and implementing a web service that follows RESTful architectural principles. Richardson describes um, four levels of REST, what he calls maturity, or how RESTful an API is. Many of you have probably seen this before. Uh, level zero is uh, URI tunneling RPC calls. So you use POST and then one URI or some URI templates, and there's no status codes. It's, it's, um, uh, everything is just into the body, inside the body of that um, post. Level one is uh, you might have multiple URIs that map to functions, uh, but you still have one verb. You are still tunneling RPC through, through, um, through HTTP. Uh, level two is HTTP, as it was intended, CRUD services on URI addressable resources. Um, status codes are used. We use HTTP as it was designed. Now, if we think for a moment about what we just did with subdomains, what we did was level two. Uh, HTTP is an implementation of a RESTful uniform interface, so any HTTP client uh, can work with it without a lot of tight language coupling. Level three is uh, what we call, uh, uh, incorporates what we call HATOIS. Um, we'll talk about this in a moment. It, it really is one of the defining characteristics of REST in Richardson's model. And um, HADIOS stands for Hypertext as the Engine of Application State. And we'll talk about what that means in a few moments. So let's revisit our subdomains example and see if we can bump it from level two to level three. If you remember when we viewed a subdomain request, uh, uh, when we, yeah, the, the view subdomain request looks like this. This doesn't change um, f going from level two to level three but the response does. I've, I've omitted the headers and so forth so we can focus on the response. What's different here is the presence of links. When you hear people talk about REST and about hypermedia or hypertext, they really just mean links. And now what value does this give us? W one of the things it gives us is it establishes that the API is responsible not just for the representations of the resource, but also the different levers and knobs that are available to interact with the state of that resource. So if you're not sending back hypermedia in your responses, if the client cannot navigate through the, through the API um, without reading a manual and, and knowing what, 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 these, what links are valid, it, it's, it's not RESTful. So REST implies responses with hypermedia that guide the client through the states of the application. This level of API maturity is frankly hard to get to. Um, I would be delighted if we could all get to level two uh, just using HTTP as it was intended. Um, but from there, it's not really not too far um, to, to you know, get into to REST. And I'll, I'll emphasize, I'm not selling REST. I'm not saying it's the right thing or the best thing. Um, it, it's, it's just important that we all understand what REST is so that we can talk about it in the same way. Um, 
but it's totally fine if an API is not restful. Not, not every, rest is not the objective. Um, the objective is to make life better for the API consumers, um, that we can de decouple the client from the logic, from the uh, server logic, and, um, and make changes easy and, and, and possible. So rest happens to be one of the better ways to do that, um, but, but there are others. Okay, so now we've considered that. What about listing subdomains? This doesn't change, the request doesn't change, but our response may change. Here is a RESTful get subdomains response. Each subdomain in the list has a links property that describes the actions for the subdomain that we just saw in the previous uh, a couple of slides ago. Uh, we also return a link section that includes pagination for the subdomain's resource itself so that the client can programmatically know how to get around. When we build navigation links into the response, we further decouple the client, making it actually very simple and very dumb in many ways. There will always be necessarily some semantic coupling between the client and the server. Um, otherwise, we couldn't get anything done. But when we can just refer to things by name, such as the next and previous and first links here, um, then the API is free to change its implementation uh, without breaking clients. You can think of the link name itself, self, next, prev, um, as a function name or a method name and the corresponding value as the function body, right? We should be free to change the function body as long as the semantics of the function call don't change. This is just basic abstraction. Subdomains is a nice example because it fits the CRUD model. We've talked about that. But not everything naturally fits into the CRUD model um, with hierarchies and simple nouns and collection resources. Uh, we can usually find a way to do it, though. Um, processes can be turned into events and identified as resources. So instead of uh, ordering a book or paying for a book, we create an order or make a payment. Um, another approach is to create a subordinate resource like status that can be modeled as a RESTful resource. And finally, modeling a process as an event is uh, almost always a, a great approach. So the point is not to create nouns out of everything. The, the point is to create a meaningful resource that maps clearly back to some statement of intent or uh, that the application, uh, that's the point, is to make, make, uh, that f make it obvious to the application what is happening. Resources allow us to model processes in ways that they can uh, be represented as stateful documents. How do we model something like a temperature change? So when we set the temperature, we aren't actually changing the temperature in the house. We are expressing our desire or intention to change the temperature. How would we model something like this? One way to think about this, and this is an exercise I go through whenever I design an API, is to think about a big bureaucracy that has forms for everything. Right? If you want to change the temperature, you need to fill out the request to change temperature form 92A. And, um, in this form, you indicate the desired temperature, when you want the change to occur, how long you want the change to last, and who should be notified if we are unable to reach the desired temperature. Um, when you have filled out the form, you receive an identification number so that you can use, that you can use to ask about the status of the request. Now, I'm not suggesting we need to make all of our APIs big and bureaucratic, um, but we do need to make sure that the API matches both the user interface needs and the business needs. Um, API calls that don't return in under a second or two, two is a long time to wait. Um, and all API calls that kick off batch jobs ought to be modeled asynchronously. Otherwise, it's like dropping off the car at the mechanic, right? But instead of getting out of your car and going over to the, you know, the donut shop or something like that, the mechanic locks you in the car and you have to wait there until the, the repair work is done, right? That's what we do to our customers or clients whenever we don't model asynchronously, something that is slow. All right, so in this next example, we're going to look at some resources that do not obviously fall into CRUD patterns, some of which might be asynchronous. So let's say we have a store, and we sell internet domain names. Now, I'm talking like a storefront. You'd walk into the doors and go up to the counter and say, I want to, I want to buy some dom a domain name. What information do we need to ask from the customer? All right, what domain name would you like to buy, of course? Um, we need some registration information. Uh, fill out these forms for the who is and the administrative and technical contacts and all those kinds of things. And we need to know how to take your money. And um, you know, would you like some privacy with that? So there's a lot going on here every time we uh, register a domain name. What are the actions that can be done with a domain name? 
What are the things we do with domains? We register them. We renew them. Sometimes they get canceled. Uh, we might need to update the who is contact information. So remember, um, these are all actions now. How could we think of these as resources? Here's, a, here's some ideas. Register becomes a registration. Renew is a renewal. We have cancellations. And then a change request to update the who is information. Again, the, the intention um, is not to noun everything, but it's to model these processes in terms of resources in a way that's beneficial and simple for the client to understand and use. How these resources map back to our backend platform is, is an orthogonal concern. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. So the representation of a registration includes the domain name, uh, the number of years they want the domain for and privacy preference. Um, uh, for, for new registrations, we also have to collect billing, uh, the registrant and who is information. Now, why, why wouldn't we split this um, across separate registration, billing, registrant, and who is requests API? Right, we totally could, right? We could, we, could make the, we could make the customer do four things instead of one thing, and that would be kind of, right, the, these are all separate concerns, right? We talk about separation of concerns. These are doing totally different things. They're hitting different backends, different databases, different tables. Why wouldn't we do that? We could split it. That's how the platform would do it. But consider that if the registration resource were modeled as four separate resources, what we do is we have pushed the business logic about how to register a domain name up into the client. Now every client must know the process of registration, what steps to call, what order, what to do when one of those four things fails. Um, that's a lot of business logic that, the, that has to be duplicated across every kind of client, mobile clients. Every year we rebuild the front end. Um, that's a lot of business logic. So, Instead of a customer visiting the registration counter, we have to make sure that every customer is given a detailed procedure and checklist. You know, we, we don't want to do that. Um, this is the difference between what we call coarse-grained resources and fine-grained resources. RESTful architectures prefer coarse-grained resources because it insulates the client from transactional business logic. Now, the platform probably should model this as four separate concerns because they are four separate models underneath the hood but we wouldn't expose our REST client to that. The REST client wants to create a domain registration, which imposes an ordering and wraps it in a transaction uh, around those platform models. Now, the client could still collect all of those things in four steps, as many steps as make sense for the UI. Whatever the UX um, people have designed could be done. Uh, we're not di dictating anything about the construction of the UI, only that its final interaction with the API is to create a domain name registration with all of this information that we need. This pattern of coarse-grained resources is something you often see when modeling complex or multi-step business processes. And a final question you might wonder about, why is the registration resource not plural like it, is with, like it was with subdomains? Any ideas? That's very close. You would never fetch a collection of registrations. You could, right? You can conceive of show me my registration, something like that. The difference is here is that we are modeling a process of registration. We're taking the whole notion of a registration process, and that's what we're calling a registration. We could. It is not a collection of resources. You're both right. Um, but we could model a collection of resources, but that would be a separate URI. So in this case, this is what we're what we're doing here is not. Um, the, it, 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 again, it's the process of registration that happens to coincide with, with a, it, it's plural as well. So in that case, you conclude the other verbs essentially from a process. Well, you would not necessarily get your registration. You might get your registrations. Correct. You're not going to do a get on the registration. Correct. Unless yeah. Sort of, yeah. Uh, this is right. This is the registration process, and its analog would be register. Sure. Right? That's the verb part of this, and this is now a noun part. The now, other question I have with course green uh, web services, which I agree upon, agree yeah. with, by the way, but it does to some degree include the notion of microservices, which are often font green. Yeah, they are. We want to address that in this talk, or maybe we can take it. Yeah, we, we, I'll just say that, that um, what, what you model for the client um, and, and how you model your platform are separate concerns. And we talked about that three-layer sandwich there. 
the middle um, HTTP layer and the, and the platform layer at the bottom. That platform layer in this case would be those microservices. Um, so, but very, very good point to make. Now we could model a, collect, a registrations resource and post to it. And, and it would really be the same and I think that would be an acceptable way to do it as well. Can you please repeat the question in the room? Oh, the question was um, about uh, microservices uh, which are typically modeled um, using fine grain resources. And, and why, uh, how does that fit into this scheme? And uh, my answer is that um, uh, in, in, in the, uh, you're welcome, the, uh, yeah, the, the, that those become the platform at, as far as the customers, you know, as far as this last API layer is concerned. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here is a possible response to our domain name registration. We see by the 202 status code that this is an asynchronous response. The server is not done yet, and it may not be done for a while. And that's perfectly okay. Our client can either wait and pull for updates or move on and do some other things. Um, now, we notice a few things here that we're using a new media type of application HAL plus JSON. HAL is short for hypertext application language. And I have a link to that specification at the end of the slides that I'll, I'll share out. Uh, HAL JSON is a standard that describes how to include hypermedia in JSON responses. It's one of many, and I'm not pushing it. I'm just, it was just convenient, and it's quite terse, which, which is great for slides. Um, our user interface should be aware that uh, incomplete resources are not just possible, but typical or common. And they handle that situation gracefully. So for example, the customer, uh, if the customer next attempted to update the registration information, the application knows by virtue of the 202 response that this is an asynchronous response and not to display any visual affordances that would lead the user to believe that they could make changes. Um, we could also include some status information, uh, but that, that's, that's as more of a visual aid. Uh, we wouldn't depend on that in the UI to, for the affordances part because that's outside of the, the uniform interface. The 202 is the uniform interface in this situation. And finally, we see that the server has returned all of the possible states of this registration resource we can get to from here. Uh, we can view the status of the registration through self. Uh, we can view a list of registrations, and there's our registrations plural resource. And then um, uh, and we can uh, cancel this registration as well. So what would this look like maybe on the client side? We're going to zoom up now into the, into the world of HTML. And again, I'm making up some completely simplified syntax here just to make the point. The API knows what the state of the resource is. So rather than the client asking so many questions, can I do this, can I do this, can I do that? Um, we just give the client all of the affordances it needs based on the state of the resource. So instead of hard coding URIs into the JavaScript or HTML templates, we can just look up the key of self or list or cancel and set the appropriate link. Uh, even better, our client would check for the presence of those links is, is cancel here, is update here, and would not show a particular action to the user if that were not present in the response. And this way, the, the logic from the UI almost completely disappears in terms of process and simply is reacting to the state of the resource. Uh, notice also that we have no strings in this code. There's no English words in the HTML. And this comes from the API, uh, which knows the right language based on the HTTP accept language header and can pull, that out, can pull out the right strings for us like this. Maybe you notice that we set our accept language to Spanish when we made the API call. Um, the browser sends this information to us in a header as part of all HTTP requests. This is content negotiation that we talked about earlier. And here are the strings in Spanish. Um, our client gets a ton of nice things for free and knows next to nothing about the business logic. Its only concern is the application and presentation logic. We could even pull these strings out into a file that both the API and the client can share. And that's perfectly acceptable also. If the client did need to get uh, sort of out of band access to those kinds of strings, they could be in a, in a .js file on the server that you know, comes from the server, uh, from, from, the, from the API, but is accessible from the client as well. Um, and this is the kind of response we get when we get a registration. I'm gonna click a link here, this one here. So we're going to look at the status, the current state of the registration. This is the self, um, handle. And um, here is a representation of our domain registration. We can see that its current status uh, is in progress. Um, we also see all kinds of subordinate information for this registration. We can see that the uh, registrant uh, 
and the who is information, each of which has its own URI. And we have um, billing information, which applies to the whole, whole account. So that's a slash billing URI. And then some privacy information on the domain. Um, I also have the link section here collapsed to save some space. But it still includes a link to self, list, and cancel. And, and this is what Hadios is. Hypertext is the engine of application state. The client can navigate through the states of this resource using the links provided by the resource itself. Any questions to this point? So this is what we've covered. Um, REST is a set of architectural principles that, when implemented, lowers the coupling between um, presentation and API and enables distributed uh, heterogeneous uh, network applications to scale and integrate together through a uniform interface. HTTP is, uh, was influenced and uh, influenced and was influenced by REST architectural principles. Um, every resource has at least one URI, a resource models, entities, objects, processes, events. Um, resource representations should suit the application's needs rather than make life convenient for the API author. Uh, we should model and use meaningful resources, HTTP methods and payloads to move clients through the application states. And then we should also use hyperlinks and HTTP responses to let clients discover those levers of state, how to move around. Uh, there's a lot more that we've actually skipped. Um, there's a way more to rest than what we've covered here today. Um, statelessness and caching, um, distributed systems. If you're designing one application for one client, um, REST probably won't benefit you uh, very much. Um, but when you need to integrate several, several dozen or several hundred clients and servers, um, this is where REST really um, stands out. Safety versus item potency. This relates to what side effects a client should expect when making certain kinds of requests. Um, versioning APIs. This remains a very tricky problem. I'm not going to cover it today. Um, status codes. The HTTP status codes make are more meaningful when you read them from a RESTful perspective than from an RPC perspective. If you're reading them and trying to make sense out of them from an RPC world, you're like, where are all my, you know, you want to make more status codes. Um, and you want to make more HTTP verbs. You want to do all those things because you're in the wrong paradigm. Um, they won't make much sense from an RPC perspective. And then forms. Um, the World Wide Web uses forms as an affordance to help the user know what data is needed to create a representation. Um, we did not discuss this in our API design. Um, standards such as Open API and Swagger uh, go a long way in helping the client discover what fields and options are available for those um, fields when, when creating or updating resources. And, and those should be included also in RESTful responses. Um, OK, so I have some modeling guidelines for you for those of you who, who might author um, APIs. Um, uh, prefer coarse-grained resources over fine-grained resources. Um, these coarse grain might compose lower-level resources, including um, uh, microservices and things like that. Um, this shields the front end from having to know that business logic otherwise, which is very, very handy. Um, prefer async for a slow creation resource, uh, uh, resource creation or updates. Um, Model processes, uh, using, uh, which are verbs and actions, using events, which is nouns and statements of intent. And finally, use hypermedia to help the client navigate through the application. Uh, again, where it makes sense, and it's related to that resource that you are modeling. You wouldn't include other resource um, navigation in your resource. Uh, now, um, some approaches when you are modeling, ways to what to think about in your head. Uh, ask yourself what concept or entity or process are you trying to model from the perspective of the client. Um, exposing getters and setters or fine-grained resources uh, leads to tightly coupled systems and distributed business logic. It's a mess. Um, prefer coarse-grained resources around businesses, entities, and pro business entities and processes. And, and like writing in, in your, uh, whatever your native language is, um, APIs often take many revisions to get right. And um, so avoid publishing your API as long as possible. In situations where you control both the client and the server, it, you, can, you can iterate a lot faster. Um, where you don't control the client, it's going to be harder. And uh, this is another place where hypermedia can actually help very much. Um, good APIs don't just fall into place. Um, in a situation where you have a UI already designed for you, uh, use it as your guiding star. When you don't have an application designed for you, you may 
you should probably tread carefully and um, don't commit too much because uh, you're likely to get it wrong. Um, and that's just how it goes. Um, you may have to design your own application, at least conceptually, to, to help guide some of your choices. Like, you know, what, what is a better customer experience, A or B? Just, just try it yourself and, and, you know, this is horrible because I have to put all this logic in the front end. And uh, remember that while REST is clearly defined, it may not be the right approach for every situation. I found that the costs of a full, pure REST architecture deployment comes at a very high price, and uh, both on the client and on the server. Um, and again, the objective, at least as a company, our objective is not purity of architecture, but, but to create systems with low coupling, high cohesion, um, that are easy to change, and uh, not brittle, that, that meet the needs of the business at, at an appropriate cost. Um, and you, as authors of APIs, will need to decide what trade-offs uh, are worth making in your situation. That is it. Any last questions? So um, here are some uh, reading. I, I uh, highly recommend the um, Roy Fielding's dissertation is a very readable uh, document. I recommend it to everybody. Um, there's the RESTful Web APIs by Leonard Richardson. Um, this last one here, this is a link to a website. That is uh, Leonard Richardson's, uh, where he introduced the uh, Richardson maturity model. It's, it's amusing. Um, and some other books and, and links that are useful. I have uh, published these slides to this URL here. I will send this out in the email that will allow you to um, download the slides and review them if they're useful to you, as well as uh, probably you should get them at least for the uh, third party references. Those are very good. Uh, if there are no other questions, that is all I have. Okay, thank you.